tutti, benvenuti al Teatro La Sapienza, uh, Festival del Giornalismo di Perugia, uno dei momenti per noi che uh, lavoriamo tanto sui social media e, e ci occupiamo di um, rivolte, conflitti e situazioni spesso anche uh, complicate da decifrare e verificare. Un momento molto emozionante. Uh, è il momento uh, davvero in cui Matthew Ingram di Gigaom uh, e io, che sono Marina Petrillo, facciamo letteralmente la scorta ai fianchi di uh, Elliot Higgins, a.k.a. Brown Moses. Um, tra poco Matthew vi fa una breve guida a Brown Moses per chi non lo conoscesse, anche se immaginiamo che molti di voi lo conosciate già, conosciate il suo lavoro. Posso solo dire che uh, per chi fa il nostro lavoro, uh, e spesso sta mettendo in pratica dei mestieri che prima non esistevano, con materiali che prima non erano disponibili. Um, L'esistenza di Brown Moses, anche se qualche media istituzionale ha fatto finta che Brown Moses non esistesse per molto tempo, uh, l'esistenza di Brown Moses è la dimostrazione di che cosa la, una vocazione, prima sconosciuta anche alla persona stessa, uh, può... Uh, essere di, come può essere di servizio in un momento in cui diventa necessaria per alcuni di noi, indispensabile, e può diventare addirittura un mestiere e darci qualcosa che prima non avevamo, un servizio che prima non esisteva. Uh, Matthew vi racconta cos'è Brown Moses. Okay. Um, just a quick survey. <coughs> Is this working? A quick survey. Who had heard of Elliot Higgins before? So one? Okay, a bunch. Oh. Uh, that's great. So um, I'm going to keep this short because we're, we're going to be tight on time and I want to get to Elliot's presentation. But uh, for me at least, um, Elliot is sort of a mythical figure. Um, I know he's sitting right here next to me and is a regular human being. But when I first heard about him and what he was doing, it was like uh, he, he was like the prototype of, of a sort of self-trained um, citizen journalist, a term that I, I don't really like, but a person who is not a professional journalist, not trained as a journalist, not even perhaps even thinks of themselves as a journalist, but is effectively performing the same functions as a journalist, or some of the same functions. And this is a, a, something I've been thinking about for a long time, about how the tasks that we used to define as things that journalists did have been sort of sliced up into different pieces. And so the job, uh, Clay, Clay Christensen talks about jobs to be done. Um, the, the job of a journalist consists of so many different things. One of those jobs is to find information and verify it, make sure that it's true before passing it on to readers or viewers or other journalists or whatever. That, jo that job used to be part of this long series of functions called journalism. But anyone can effectively perform that function. Andy Carvin did it quite well during the Arab Spring, using Twitter as a sort of real-time newsroom and all the people that he followed and who followed him on Twitter as a kind of real-time newsroom to verify things that were going on in Egypt. Um, Elliot's story, I think, is, is a, a different version of that, a single person dedicating themselves to making sense of something quite complicated from thousands of miles away. And we now have the tools to do that in ways that we never did before. So I'd like Elliot to uh, tell us a little bit about himself. Um, I'm going to start with a presentation. Uh, it's probably going to be easier if I stand up. So uh, this is my blog. It's not much to look at. It's quite simple. Um, I started it in March 2012 because I just wanted to um, look at stuff I was interested in. There was no grand scheme to, you know, you know, get to the point I am now. I just wanted to write about things I thought, you know, they interest me, they might interest other people. Um, but my interest actually started in 2011, not 2012, with the conflict in Libya. And um, I was one of these people who used to spend my time on the internet arguing with people about <laughs> what was happening in Li Libya. It's a very proud tradition. Um, and one day I posted a video and it claimed to show um, the rebels capturing a town. And someone said to me, how do you know this video is real? I thought to myself, actually, how do I know? I'm just taking the word of the people posting the video, and I can't really rely on that. So I'm going to give you an example of um, what I started to do, figuring out how to verify videos. So this is a very simple example. This is a TG in Libya in 2011. A video was posted 
um, showing the uh, capture of the town. And they claim we've captured this town. And you get this image where you get this tank rolling in, you can see the mosque. And I wanted to verify this video and see if it was actually true. And this is one of the first examples I used. So there's certain features, like you can see the mosque quite clearly. It's quite distinct. There's the dome, the minaret, the wall, you know, the outside of the uh, building's shape. You can also see the tank as well. Um, this gives you a good idea about the size of the road because if a it's wide enough for a tank to come down it and leave room either side. It's a pretty big road. Whoa, road. So I was looking for two key points. So I found a map of the location using Google Maps. Um, and then I s found the biggest road that was there. And I could see here using the size of the cars how wide the road was. Um, I could see it was two lanes. So I then started looking along the road looking for a mosque, and here I found a mosque. So then I knew the camera position was by the road, and it was facing towards the mosque, and on the same side of the mosque, so I assumed the position of the camera was just to the right where we can see here. So I imagined I was on the ground looking to the west, and compared to what I could see, so I knew the minaret would be right in front of me, I would see the um, wall just in front of it, and then the dome as well. And um, I then had the image of the tank as well, and you can actually see the road as it curls round as well. So that was a very basic example of verification. Um, something that was a bit more complicated, but in a way quite simple really, um, weapon smuggling in Syria in 2013. Um, I'd spent about a year by then looking at videos coming from Syria, and I was looking at all the weapons, so I was very familiar with what weapons were coming into the country. So um, I started seeing some very interesting things in video. So here's just a compilation of some of the things I started to see. So what you're here, seeing here are weapons that um, all had something in common with each other. Um, they were all weapons that came, um, had links to one country, um, Croatia. But it wasn't initially obvious that was the case because I had to do a lot of investigating to find out what these weapons actually were because I didn't recognize them because they were new to the conflicts. And, you know, prior to, to, prior to doing this, I was working in admin and finance. I wasn't studying weapons or anything. I had to learn everything day by day. So there were four main weapons that I identified, which were um, two types of rocket launchers, a grenade launcher and something known as a recordless gun. What was very interesting about the grenade launcher um, it was a copy of a um, South African grenade launcher. And I knew the M79 Oster and the M60 were from U former Yugoslavia, and the RPG-22 was used in Croatia. S so I was wondering, um, the problem with the RPG-6 is it's a copy of the Milko MGL Mark I, and they're virtually identical apart from one or two small features. And one of those features is a small boat that bolt that's on the rear of the um, grip. And I was able to find a video with clear enough resolution to confirm those bolts actually existed, confirming it was an RBG-6. I also noticed these, these were all coming into the south of the country, um, near the border with Jordan, and going to groups that were aligned with the um, Free Syrian Army. So I had a feeling they were all coming from Croatia, they were all coming into the south of the country, and you know, I took this information to the New York Times, and they used that information to contact people and say, what do you know about this? Um, and it turned out they're actually, the Saudis were actually buying weapons from Croatia, flying them to Jordan and smuggling them into the south of the country. And this was information that was, you know, virtually, it would have been unknown uh, if it wasn't for the fact it was all being posted on YouTube. There were no journalists in the area, but because they were posting stuff on YouTube, it was actually quite easy to find this out. And what's interesting as well, we, here's a selection of pictures recently from uh, the Islamic State of Iraq and al-Sham in Iraq, and they're showing pictures of them attacking the Iraqi army. And what we have here is a rocket launcher being used by them, which is the Croatian M79 Osa, one of the weapons that was smuggled to the Free Syrian Army, and that's now spread to the Islamic State of Iraq and al-Sham being used in Iraq against um, Iraqi forces. So it also allows us to track uh, weapons moving through. So on August 21st, there was the sarin attack in Damascus, and um, I was very interested in the munitions being used, and there were a number of videos posted like this showing this very unusual type of munition, and most people hadn't seen this before. They had no idea what this was. They didn't know where it came from. It was something completely new. The thing is, I'd actually seen these before. These, um, these are pictures from August 21st, but here we have on the top left August 21st. In Adra, Damascus, August 5th, the same munition. Adra, June 6th, the same munition. Daria, January 2013, the same munition. Um, I was also able to contact um, local people 
who were able to give me close-up photographs of all the, the weapon itself with measurements. So I was able to use that to build a um, diagram with Human Rights Watch of the actual munition. Um, and then another example was another munition used on August 21st, which was this rocket. Here we had a UN inspector measuring it, and I wanted to know how big it was. So what I did, I took the tape measure, I cut it out, and then moved it and used it to measure the munition myself. So I knew how wide it was, how long it was. Um, and I found that it was 140 millimeters long. So I found a diagram of a 140 millimeter artillery rocket. I matched the nozzles to the diagram of the rocket, the markings, you can see the 179 is on the thing, and I identified that as an M14 140 millimeter artillery rocket, which has a, one of the warheads is a sarin warhead. So um, quite early on, I had a, you know, this was about a few days after the attack, and three weeks later, the UN would confirm that all this information was correct in their own report. Um, but I had already identified the rockets used, and it was likely to be sarin. Um, and then I continued doing... Okay. Um, <laughs> then I continued uh, researching these weapons. I discovered they were called volcano rockets. There was an explosive version of the rocket. There were three different sizes. They'd been used by the Syrian military since late 2012. Um, they had a whole history to them. And this was all through Facebook and YouTube and Twitter. This wasn't requiring me to go out to Syria and do investigations. This was just stuff that was being posted online. These three images at the bottom, they were posted by the Syrian, the Syrian National Defense Force and other pro-government groups. So this wasn't information from the rebels. This was information from the other side. In fact, these images were from Hezbollah uh, when they were fighting in Syria with the same weapons. And they even ended up in a Hezbollah uh, victory propaganda after the uh, Yabrud offensive. Uh, you can see in the bottom left corner. And then there's the question of the range of these rockets. So we've got this map, and this is from the um, uh, Washington report. And you can see certain areas are marked as regime-dominated and opposition-dominated. But that doesn't really mean anything. What does dominant mean in the terms of this, in, militarily? So I did my own research about the range, the, where these weapons had come from. So um, here's a good example of how I can find information. This, this is a sequence of videos from the uh, opposition forces fighting a certain area. And they're showing them attacking us one location. So just keep an eye on that bridge. This is the first impact, same bridge again, and then the same bridge again. So they were, this was over a, a, few, a, set, a week or so before and after the attacks. And they were said they were attacking a checkpoint. So I wanted to know where that checkpoint was to understand where the front lines were. So here's the screenshots. And there's certain features that stand out here. This is four videos, and I could see three mosques and a mountain range in the background. And the first thing I did, I went to Google Earth. And on Google Earth, you can see the ground view, and you have topography. So that means that you can, the top view is from Google Earth, and you can see the mountain range, and the bottom view is the same mountain range in the video. So I was able to verify the position was where I thought it was. I was also able to see three mosques, and I've marked on the map on the right the position of those mosques, and it matches up to what's on the video. And also, far in the background, there was the Tishrin military hospital, which is, you can see it in the video on the bottom left. And on the top right, you can see it's miles in the distance, but it's visible on satellite map imagery, and it can map there. So I was pretty confident about the position of the checkpoint in the underpass area. I also discovered two more checkpoints. And what I also had was footage from a channel called Anna News, which was a, um, embedded with the Syrian government. And they'd filmed about 24 videos of a military operation going on two months, where the Syrian government had um, captured a strip of territory. And using the videos, I was able to, this is just one of many uh, maps I did, I was able to mark out all the positions that were being used using satellite map imagery. And from that, I managed to establish this as an area of control for the Syrian um, government on August 21st. Um, I was also able to find the precise location five of the rockets landed on August 21st using the same techniques I've used before, satellite map imagery, matching it off using the images from the photographs and videos. Um, so on the bottom right-hand side, you can see the impact sites. You can see the area controlled by the Syrian government, and the red lines are a two-kilometer line marker, and the green is 2.5 kilometers, and that's the sort of estimated range of these rockets. So this clearly shows that they were within range of the um, territory of the um, Syrian government. And if you actually look at the uh, White House map, that area I've circled in red is the area you can see on this map. And you can see just on the top left, there's an area that's completely unmarked. They, haven't, they don't even know who controls that, but I was able to establish that using open source information. So um, hopefully that just gives you an idea of the sort of stuff I do with my work. <laughs> So, so we just we just got a 15-minute sort of crash course in how to become yeah. Brown Moses. That's, that's great. I wondered, 
Um, when you, so just to take one of the things you did there, I mean, there's so many. Uh, so you had no training in weaponry, no training in sort of military technology or? No, so I, I taught myself everything. So let's say you, you, well, I have a whole ton of questions, but let's say you see a rocket or parts of a rocket. How do you determine what it is? How do you check what it is? Do you, how do you contact people who even know what it is? Well, um, I mean, the, you look at something like Wikipedia, and they have pages that list the equipment of the Syrian military. Uh -huh. So you can just start looking through. You just start off, just look at all the pictures and see which one matches. Um, and, you know, nine times out of ten, that's enough. I mean, with the volcano rockets I just showed there, they were completely new. So hmm. that was literally piecing together every, you know, there's, no one had this information on these rockets. So I had to piece it together myself. But um, as time has gone on, I've made a lot of contacts with arms specialists, chemical weapons specialists. Okay. And if I'm stuck on something, I just go and ask them and say, can you help? And how did you find them? Um, in a lot of cases, they found me. But sometimes, you know, there's other hmm. people out there who... Um, you know, Nick Jensen Jones, for example, he was running the uh, Rogue Adventurer blog, and he was a specialist in weapons, and I would just ask him questions, and we'd you know, just exchange information on what was going on. And I know one of the first times I, I saw your name, uh, other than on Twitter or in the blogosphere, was C.J. Chivers mentioned you and your research in his... C.J. Chivers writes for the New York Times, a former Marine, I'm pretty sure, mm. writes about, you know, war and so on, and he... He effectively credited you with coming up with a whole bunch of information that not only ha had he not been able to come up with, but aid groups and, and various agencies even working in the region hadn't been able to. And it just seems, uh, you know, I'm old, so it seems uh, incredible in a way that you, you're sitting in your flat in Leicester or whatever, and you're accumulating this information that, that is effectively pushing the bounds of what we know about an area you've never even been to Syria. The thing to understand with Syria, there's, uh, you know, I've got a collection of about a thousand YouTube channels used by armed groups. A thousand. Syria, a thousand, yeah. Armed groups, opposition groups, media centers. There's probably been about half a million videos posted from Syria. And millions of Facebook folk, uh, posts, including photographs. You know, it's a vast amount of information. Which is also kind of fascinating. I mean, these are terrorists or armies or, or, or governments or militaries mm. publishing their <laughs> own... Yeah, and videos and basically time. doing their own PR campaign about, yeah. and so you use their own material in a way. Well, I mean, it's quite interesting. Um, Amin Jad Al Tamimi, who's someone who's been doing a lot of work on jihadists, he just goes and friends them on Facebook. They've got <laughs> Facebook pages. He just friends them and asks them questions, and they're quite chatty. <laughs> so what used to be this thing where, you know, 10 years ago, you'd have to have some CIA agent mm -hmm, out mm -hmm. in the desert. Now you just go to their Facebook page and says, what's going on? But how do you know, let's say it's a video, um, you know, that they've published of, of an attack, presumably they're going to make it look better mm. than it might have otherwise because they're trying to make themselves look powerful. Or how do you how do you determine whether they aren't kind of manipulating the message? How do you determine that part? Well, um, I mean, there's certain things you can do. I mean, one thing I do is you know, if there's a statement being made about something, I can look at the you know Facebook pa pages of other groups that may have been involved in the operation right. and see if they're saying the same thing. And, you know, a lot of the stuff I do, you know, I don't speak Arabic, so the reason I started looking at weapons is because you don't need to speak Arabic to identify a weapon. Right. So, um, you know, when I'm looking at something, if they're claiming something about a weapon, I can, you know, I know about it, I can mm -hmm. just search it and find out about it. It's, the, it's there in the images. But it's, um, I mean, you have to be quite cynical about stuff that's being made, but a lot of people seem to think every other video from Syria has been faked in some way. And it's really a very tiny percentage. And, um, you know, sometimes it, stuff can be very revealing. Like one example, I saw a video um, where it showed a group of captured uh, soldiers who were lined up on the floor. And they said they were captured in an ambush. And then another group who was in the same military operation filmed the same group of men, but they were all dead. And you could actually match all their clothes. You could match stuff that was in the background. And you can see they'd just been, from one video to another, they'd just been shot when they'd been captured. And that's obviously a war crime. But there were four or five groups that were filming the same Right. set of bodies and, and one set one set was saying oh you know they were they were killed in an ambush everyone was saying they were killed in an ambush but that was clearly untrue because of the other information in the video so then you can see um clearly something's happened there and it's worth looking into right. Got a couple of questions for you because uh, the analysis and identifying and debunking and you know the whole process of verification that you do um sometimes it's also you know the identifying of names written items matching things uh, sometimes faces um uh, especially everything that you do about the smuggling of weapons and the provenance of weapons. Yeah. Uh, 
actually builds a map that for me, like uh, I've, I've seen it, you know, building and building, becomes very political because sometimes you're debunking a version of things that we've all bought into. Uh, sometimes you're upturning a propaganda item. Uh, sometimes you're just saying, wait, 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 people, especially in the case of chemical weapons, uh, there's more to know about this and we can get deeper into this. Um, when was the moment you realized that it was not just, uh, you know, uh, let's say a mechanical mm -hmm. video game uh, thing mm -hmm. and it just became, you know, the political burden of what you were doing was, was upon you? Um, I mean, that's, that's hard to say. I mean, it's, you know, the first time I identified cluster bombs in 2012, I was the first person to identify yeah. those. And that led to Human Rights Watch being able to challenge the Syrian government's claims yeah. that they weren't using cluster bombs. Mm -hmm. We ended up with, you know, 500 videos of cluster bombs being used in Syria. Um, uh, you know, another example is with the Croatian weapons story. That was obviously, you know, revealing what the Syrian opposition was up to. Yeah. I, I think something people forget about that is it's not just about the Syrian opposition receiving weapons, but it's also about the people who are, you know, buying and selling the weapons and profiting from them. Yeah. And, you know, I've been told names of individuals involved who are not the sort of people you would want your governments to be working with. So there's a lot more to stories than just saying, oh, it's just these weapons are appearing. There's a whole backstory to yeah. it. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it was maybe the Croatian weapons, maybe the cluster bombs when that's... You know, it's been interesting, like, bow bombs, when they first appeared 18 months ago, they've only really become more well-known now, but they've been around for 18 months. So, uh, you know, they came... You know, just they came to be kind of a, um, you know, a, a totem for a lot of people about the awfulness of the conflict. Mm -hmm. yeah. I've noticed um, you've... Act every time I mention you on Twitter um, or, or anywhere, there are people who respond in the comments or on Twitter saying, well, Brown Moses is, you know, in, in the pockets of these specific groups or he's biased towards this or that group. I'm assuming you see those things all the time. How do you deal with that? Well, I've blocked them all now, so I don't <laughs> see any more. So, but, you know, I mean... I, do you respond or do you just ignore Generally them? not. I mean, it's yeah. like at the moment... I, for example, I'm doing a project at the moment with the Carter Center where they've um, actually spent the last couple of years mapping out all the armed groups. They've got, I think, 5,400 armed groups in Syrian command structures. What I'm doing now with them is looking at where the weapons have gone to during the conflicts, and we're mapping out where the Croatian weapons went and where these U.S. weapons are going, just to understand how weapons are spreading throughout the conflict. And I don't see that as a particularly pro-opposition thing to be doing. Right. So, but, you know, this is something that I'm doing as a project aside from the work I do now, because I get, you know, various consultancies offered to me to analyze information from the conflict. But it's, you know, it's like with these um, US anti-tank missiles that have appeared recently. The first thing I wanted to find out is where they were coming from, who was giving them mm -hmm. um, to the opposition. I and mean, it's quite funny, actually, they posted a video where they held one of the rockets up to the video and you could see all the markings really clearly, including like the various serial numbers. They'd actually tried to rub out one of the serial numbers, but because the video quality was so good, you could actually enhance the video and all the numbers would just reappear from where they've rubbed them off. What? <laughs> So you could see, I think the last people to have them in 2012 were the uh, U.S. Marines, according to the marking. So, you know, the information's there, and that's stuff I was talking about on Twitter. Anyone could have read that. Um, uh, people who have a big me media institution uh, around them usually are very protecting, and they kind of mm. blend into the institution, and they don't have to make any hard choices because the institution has made those choices for them. And I think I'm thinking ethical and moral. Uh, issues, boundaries of independence as far as funding is concerned. Um, you just work on your own and the institution takes care of all of that. And you had to go through all these steps on your own. How did you deal with the boundaries you set? I know you set yourself boundaries for defining yourself as an independent analyst, mm. uh, especially regarding funding. Um, I can remember uh, last year's Kickstarter campaign was actually a very small campaign and Elliot asked for 6,000 yeah. pounds, if they're English pounds. Uh, he got just slightly above that, and he just stopped, and he said, that's enough for me for fully blogging, uh, for blogging full-time for six months, if I, if I can remember correctly. Yeah, yeah. What are your boundaries, and how did you work them you know, for yourself? The way I see it, if someone comes to me and says, we're going to give you money, but you can't write about this, or you have to write about this, I'll do a blog post about it, because that's a far more interesting story than you know, what they would want me to do. Um, I'm in a very fortunate position now where I can actually afford, you know, to keep going and do, you know, it's my full-time job. It's been my full-time job since um, I basically finished my real job, which was working mm -hmm. in admin and finance in uh, late two, uh, early 2013. Um, so I, I've basically been working on this full-time for the past, you know, over a year now. 
Um, what was a hobby now is my full-time job, and I'm just growing and growing what I'm doing. I'm constantly looking for new projects. Um, for example, I'm trying to find a, someone who will fund um, the archiving of the material from August 21st, because I've gathered you know, 400 videos, dozens of, well, hundreds of pictures, you know, there's Facebook posts, Twitter posts, and the way I see it is this information is slowly disappearing from the internet because it's just, you know, it's just the nature of it, and no one's preserving it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is something that will be talked about for, you know, generations to come, certainly in Syria, and no one's preserving what's, you know, first-hand evidence of the attacks. I wanted, I wanted to ask you about that, the, particularly Facebook, because you wrote a blog post um, which I wound up writing about, about how Facebook, for, for their own reasons, it is removing, has been removing pages, uh, user accounts, <coughs> videos, content related to attacks, presumably because they believe it's, it crosses some, you know, ethical barrier. They don't want people to be disturbed by, you know, explosions and dead bodies and whatnot. But your point was that this is effectively, you know, making history vanish. I mean, some of these pages are are, are a record of, of events that occurred that, that we should preserve. How do, I mean, Facebook, that for me brings up lots of issues that I think journalists have to deal with when proprietary platforms like Facebook and Twitter are involved. You can't necessarily count on them to do what we think as, as journalists should be done in, in, in terms of keeping information or maintaining, even op ma making information open. I think it's very important to be able to engage with, you know, Facebook and Twitter and YouTube and explain to them why it's important to keep this information. Mm -hmm. Even if they delete these pages, just take, you know, just to keep it offline somewhere so researchers can actually request this information. Because I looked at the August 21st attacks and the, there was about 11 Facebook pages posting first-hand reports from medical centers, you know, what actually happened mm -hmm. in those first key hours. And um, I think about 80, 85% of those pages have been deleted now, uh, just gone forever. Um, hopefully they're saved somewhere. In Have Facebook. you tried to talk to Facebook about that? Um, not. I've been trying to figure out the best way to go about that. I think I may have had maybe a tiny breakthrough on that. But um, you just email Mark, maybe. Yeah, that's true. I might just email Mark <laughs> and say, "Hey, don't delete stuff off Facebook." <laughs> but um, the, interestingly, there's someone who's actually set up a site called um, Agema, where they you can put in a Facebook page and it'll archive all the posts in the Facebook mm -hmm. page. Um, and they're working on adding more functionality to it, for example, um, image searching, because the Facebook is, Facebook is rubbish terrible. for yeah. finding it, like yeah. information. Yeah. Um, but if you can search for specific date ranges and stuff like that, it would be very, very powerful. Hmm. Of course, they wouldn't be able to find the pages that have been deleted. Yeah, unfortunately, yeah. 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 But it's, kind of, it's like now, whenever I see something on Facebook, the first thing I do is make sure it's saved on this new uh, uh, site, so that when I, because what's been happening... So you can go back later. Well, I mean, what's been happening is you've mentioned something on Facebook and then the next day it's been deleted because someone's had a campaign to report all the posts on it and get it deleted. Right. And in fact, I know Facebook gets sort of delete um, attacks, so sort of denial of service attacks, where if you complain often enough, Facebook will delete something because they figure lots of people don't like it. But you, if you can encourage enough people to kind of bomb them with complaints, you can get pages taken down. Yeah, I mean, it just seemed like that there is just a campaign by some people just to take down these opposition pages. Mm -hmm. I, go ahead. I, 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 I just wanted to go back to the boundaries thing. Sure. Uh, it, it, did, did you set yourself a policy for, for all the choices I mean, you make from the equipment that you use, uh, the money that you need, the time that you're going to spend on this? Um, some, sometimes you work with really I know very sort of gory materials, and it can be very hard. Um, and you know, Mr. I was going back to the independence thing. How did you? What is your manifesto for yourself? Um, I mean, it's kind of changed as things. You know, I started this blog just because I wanted to write things about you know I was interested in. Um, but now I'm you know I'm working on launching a new site called Bellingcat where I'm bringing together about 15 contributors to start with who use open source information to investigate aspects of various conflicts. So you know I've got people who look at jihadists in Syria, Hezbollah's involvement, you know someone looking at Nigeria, Kurdistan, yeah. but they rely on you know they look at open source information as part of their work. Um, the other side of that as well is actually educating people how to use open source information because mm -hmm. at the moment. The, I see this again and again. The problem isn't that people don't know how to do it. They don't know they can do it. They don't even know you can actually yeah. go out and look at these videos. And just telling, like this event, just telling people it's possible is one thing. And then 
the sort of details and the nitty gritty of it and teaching mm -hmm. people is something else. And that's kind of, now what I'm looking at is teaching people, well, awareness and education really. That's wonderful. Um, actually, they told us that we have to leave the theater, mm -hmm. uh, our, you know, our group, you people in the room, 10 minutes before 11, uh, so that uh, we can get outside and we people coming in can sit down. So uh, if, if we're okay with that, we can start taking questions from, yeah, the, from, the, ground, from the room. Do we have uh, a mic? Se qualcuno vuole fare domande, non abbiamo moltissimo tempo, quindi siccome pensavamo fosse bello anche sentire le vostre curiosità in modo che poteste approfittare della presenza di Elliot qua. Credo che abbiamo un, micro, un radio microfono. Hi, hi. No. Non funziona il microfono. Era spento. No, it doesn't work. No. So the question is, have you ever been wrong? Yeah. And what will you do when you are wrong? Um, I, I like to think I haven't been wrong. I think some <laughs> people would debate that. But um, the thing is, I use open source. Because I'm using open source information, I can just say, mm -hmm. you know, this mm -hmm. is what I have, how I figured it out. You can take a look yourself. So when I'm doing a blog You're post, potentially never wrong. Well, I mean, just people can check it themselves because the yeah. information is there. It's not like I'm using anonymous sources telling right. me stuff, and um, I'm just using information that, that's out there for anyone to look at. Um, you know, it's like with the August 21st attacks. A lot of people were saying, well, these are clearly homemade weapons. There's no way that the Syrian um, military would have these weapons. But, you know, I've collected multiple videos of the Syrian military using it. Um, you know, people have made claims that say, you know, the range is too short to be fired from government-held territory. But as I just demonstrated, that's not true. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, the, the, you know, the advantage I have is I have the information. I can just show them. If they say I'm wrong, I can just say, well, this is how I've come to my conclusions. And, that, and that's actually much better than, say, a story in the New York Times where they quote just anonymous sources, government sources, or mm. saying you're, you're, X. You're actually more the, accountable right, than Right, and there's no way to prove yeah. it because they don't actually give you any of the evidence that they base their... I mean, I do get told stuff, you know, by you know, anonymous sources, off the record, you know, information like that. I generally never use that stuff. If I can find an open source piece of information to support Supporting. it, that's yeah. what I use. Um, it usually just directs me to look at certain things. It's like that checkpoint I was talking about. That was because someone, a uh, local person, said there was a checkpoint there. I thought, let's see if there's videos of that actual yeah. checkpoint in existence. And, you know, there were. I, I wondered, um, be just before we go to the audience again, this was something that, that I was curious about when I first heard about what you were doing. So n no journalistic background, no training in weaponry, no previous interest in Syria. I mean, when Andy Carvin started doing what he was doing, he knew a bunch of people in Egypt and had already been there and so on. Why? Why did you, why did you, so you're, you're an admin a, accountant executive, you're, were you just bored or, and why did you pick sort of, why did, and why? What, did you ever imagine that you would be I said, an expert? I, in I, said I certainly wasn't an executive in that okay. <laughs> level. But um, the um, it, it's just I've always had an interest in you know um, you know politics and you know I, when I was younger I'd read things like you know John Pilger and Noam Chomsky and stuff like that and you know that kind of leftist st stuff and that gave me an interest in kind of global politics, especially American involvement in various countries. Libya came along and I was very interested in that and I just realised there was this vast amount of information out there and no one was writing about it or using it. Um, and then I started the blog and started looking at Syria and there was even more information there. So I just started saying, what do I want to know? So the first thing I wanted to know is what weapons the Syrian opposition had and no one had written about that. Yet I had dozens of videos showing them waving weapons about. So I just said, okay, what are they? I'll look it up and Google did it. Did you get sort of sucked into a rabbit hole? I mean, did you imagine <laughs> when you first started your blog that, that this would become your life? No, I pretty much started the blog just to, you know, like internet arguments so I could like refer <laughs> to stuff <laughs> and it's just I just built it up I just said okay then it sort of became like I sort of challenged myself okay do a interview someone uh, do a live blog mm -hmm. it's like I did a live blog of the hula massacre of the information coming through with that that's when I first realized there were channels that were posting videos from specific locations okay. so then I started reviewing the channels so just bit by bit I built up and then it turned into you know then I had journalists coming to me asking me information I thought oh this is quite exciting and I just really got into it and then it just you know <laughs> Do you want the questions? No? When, when do you sleep? 
<laughs> well, I've got a two-year-old, so not very much at the moment. But yeah. Um, anyway. <laughs> I mean, it's, it is a situation where I'm always constantly checking my phone for, you know, emails and Twitter mm. updates, and just to see if any, because you know, it's not. It's a 24 hours a day, seven days a week conflict. It's like with August 21st, I was up early on that day because my, my daughter had woken up and I just checked my phone and Twitter was just full of all these reports and videos of this attack. And the first thing I did, I just gathered all the videos into a playlist and shared it with um, journalists, as many journalists as possible, because I knew that's what they would be looking for, footage of the actual attack. Mm. Um, and then I just started, you know, I just sort of think, when I see stuff like that, I think, what will, what's the best information to gather? It's like with the chemical bow bomb attacks recently. Right. I've created playlists showing videos for each of the chemical bow bomb attacks, you know, showing the victims, uh, some showing helicopters dropping bow bombs that may or may not be related, but the locals say they are. Um, images of the bow bombs themselves and the gas cylinders inside them. And I gather that, not just for myself, but to share with you know, journalists, activists, researchers, just to get that information out there. Uh, a question there. Funziona? Ok. There we go. Allora, avrei due domande. Uh, la prima è se um, non conoscere la lingua è mai stato un problema, nel senso che finora, da quel che ho capito, si, um, ha basato tutto il suo lavoro sul, uh, sullo studio proprio del, delle immagini, ma se c'è mai stato un caso in cui non conoscere la lingua è stato un problema. E il, la seconda domanda è uh, qual è la, la, la relazione che ha con uh, i giornalisti professionisti, se uh, in un certo senso la invidiano, se cercano di imitarla, se uh, in un modo o nell'altro, come anche riconoscono il, il suo lavoro. So you'll have to translate. No, so I'm sorry, you didn't know we weren't wearing hats. Yeah, I'll translate for you. Yeah. Um, uh, he was uh, asking two questions. First thing, he knows he, he don't speak Arabic and he didn't when he started. Uh, so he's wondering if uh, uh, most of the work was visual and it, it wouldn't uh, uh, represent a problem for you or how you're dealing with, and I know you're dealing with that uh, with the help of interpreters, yeah. translators. So if you want to get in a bit into that. And the second question is your relationship with professional journalists, um, if they envy you, mm -hmm. uh, if they would like to be like you, if they ignore you, if they mm -hmm. work with you. And Good question. So okay. Um, for the first question, yeah, I'm, I didn't speak Arabic and I was just looking at the images um, that I could see in these videos. Um, and, you know, that was why I started looking at weapons. Um, but as time went on, I got, you know, lots of twi fo Twitter followers who spoke Arabic. So I would just say, you know, does anyone know what this says? Um, Eventually, I was given funding to write an Arabic version of my blog, and I actually got a full-time translator who would translate entire videos wow. for me. Um, and now I just have, you know, just a network of people who will do translations for me. Um, as for the other question, I would say the vast majority of journalists uh, who I talk to are very supportive of what I do and interested in my work. And do you, do you think of yourself as a journalist? Um, not, I sort of see the journalism side of it as more of a means to an end of getting the information out there. Because, you know, there's a lot of, um, you know, I, I don't think I'm a particularly good writer. I mean, I, <laughs> whenever I'm asked to do an article for a magazine or a newspaper, I dread writing the opening and the ending of it because I just, I just rubbish at doing that. So I just prefer to do the research and let other people write about my research. Because hmm. I know I've had discussions with journalists about both you and Andy Carbon, and I've had journalists say that those people are not journalists. Um, which oh yeah, still on that thing. <laughs> yeah, which seems farcical in a way. I mean, I can't understand how anyone wouldn't see, you know, that the, the practice of aggregating and verifying and sharing information as journalism. But it still seems there there are groups that don't see that as because I it's not done because you're not a journalist who was trained at a journalism school. Well, I, I often get asked this question, and sometimes the person asking the question, I say, well, I don't think I am a journalist, and they say, well, really, if you think about it, you are. I go. Well, she was wondering, like, besides uh, uh, the uh, uh, raw materials that you use, like videos and blah, 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 uh, she would like you to get more into the tools that you use uh, to verify uh, information. Um, it's pretty basic, actually. It's um, 
you know, with videos, it's videos from YouTube that I use Google Earth satellite map imagery to, you know, match the information. It's just all visual. I mean, there's no fancy tools. You know, if I use something, it's free. You know, if I'm looking at... Use a ruler. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's <laughs> simple. It's just simple stuff. It's like the um, video verification. Um, but if I see a video and there's something in one frame, I just use the web website KeepVid to download the video. I put, open it up in VLC Media Player where you can watch stuff frame by frame and enhance the image. Mm. And this is all stuff that's free and out there to use. So I don't really use any fancy tools apart from just looking at stuff and you know putting stuff in a spreadsheet or looking at it on Google Earth or so just you know. I sort of picture it as uh, you have a big lab like in CSI Miami or something, and you have you have like 15 screens, and then you know you can zoom in like 5,000 times onto a. That's not it. That's a little laptop. You don't have a big lab. <laughs> so, so what you're saying is that <coughs> you were mentioning before that these tools actually, theoretically, anybody can use yeah. if they want. If they if if they want to learn they, how to use them. If they don't feel like sleeping. If they don't feel like <coughs> sometimes sleeping and sometimes sleeping well, because how <laughs> how do you sleep? Is <laughs> that when? I know I'm asking you how. No, I mean That's seriously. The, do do the, some of those images kind of follow you mm -hmm. in your sight. Very disturbing imagery in some cases. I think the thing you have to understand is, you know, I've, <laughs> I've had a lot of, you know, I've, my life has really changed a lot and, you know, yeah. I've, I'm able to do stuff that I want to do now. I've, you know, I can do anything I want now with my work. I get to uh, kind of my pick of work. You know, I have journalists and, you know, I've, like the BBC and the Guardian coming to me to ask me stuff and ask to speak at the stuff. So, I was discussing this last night, night actually. And the thing is, when I watch videos, if there's a video on YouTube and I can see the preview of, like, it's a baby with their legs blown off, I don't need to watch that video because everything in the video is in the preview. I don't need to watch that. And there's kind of this visceral element to what you see, and you can sort of overcome that, but then when you're watching a video, like, if I have to watch a video with something horrible in it, I turn the sound off because I can't speak Arabic, so I don't know what they're going to be saying anyway. And that kind of audio element is quite... It's more affecting in a way where, yeah. you, and you just sort of disassociate yourself. And you know, you're saying cup of tea compatible. If I don't like something I'm seeing, if it's upsetting, I can go and have a cup of tea. I have <laughs> to say, I have to say in this subject that um, I, w I was just thinking um, recently that probably the fact that you approached the whole serious situation from the weapons side allowed you to uh, be of service with information about the people without getting to the people, mm -hmm. the people's images, which I think are the most shocking and mm -hmm. first layer of, of, of meaning that most media use. Well, entering from a side entrance, mm -hmm. the weapons thing, um, substance about the war is still there, and but you're fact, not into the gory thing. Yeah, and in fact, you mentioned how the good thing about starting with weapons is there are facts. Yeah. You know, weapons are shaped in a certain way. They look a certain way. They have numbers on them. They're physical. They're, right, and there are maps, and there are they move on the ground images, and you can sort of compare things. So it's 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 almost purely factual. I mean, it's one thing that I find frustrating. It's like the cluster bombs. Some people still deny cluster bombs are being used in Syria. You know, pro acid people. They say, I've seen 500 videos posted over multiple YouTube channels from across all of Syria. Unless there's like a bus going around Syria <laughs> planting cluster bombs to be filmed by these various organisations. It's, it seems absurd, and you do get to this absurd level with some people where they just will deny absolutely mm -hmm. anything without any logic being involved at all. And I, I do think that, I don't know if you feel this as well, but I do think that some people have, because we're so used to uh, fake photos and fake videos and sort of manufactured PR campaigns, people to some extent may have too much skepticism. They actually believe that anything that comes out from a specific group is probably fake, which which probably is not true. Another example is with these chemical barrel bombs that have been dropped recently, you know, chlorine and ammonia cylinders inside uh, barrel bombs, DIY barrel bombs dropped from helicopters. There's been about a dozen attacks. The Facebook posts, uh, YouTube videos all show people saying these were dropped from helicopters. There's some videos that claim to show them being dropped from helicopters or the impacts. Um, we've got videos of the bombs on the ground bent, destroyed, you know, the remains of cylinders, um, you know, the telegraph did samples, uh, there's x-rays of the chest, and there's still people who say, oh no, this is almost, you know, they, they, they come through and say, oh, well, it's almost certainly fake. Why would Assad do a chemical attack? Yet you've got all this information from multiple attacks, which, you know, is completely consistent. So really what they're saying is, I think there's a conspiracy between multiple villages to basically cover up um, Jabhat al-Nusra chemical IEDs. 
And when you think of the logic of that, it right. just doesn't, the amount of organization that would be needed in a war zone, if they, if they were that organized, they would have won the conflict uh, by right. now. Yeah, sure, right. already. Right. Um, we had a question from, he lives in Cairo, he works as a correspondent. Oh, uh, sorry. Like, like, more than a question is like, <laughs> okay, works. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, the the thing is like, I mean, like, why do you think that like uh, journalists who have like uh, a different training, a different background, and everything else struggle somehow to do what you're doing? Because if you look, if you look on Facebook groups like uh, the Vulture Club, for example. I mean, like, it's kind of amazing for someone who's trying to be a foreign correspondent and look at the information and everything else, that you see these huge, huge conversations between, like, experienced journalists, people working in human rights, doing investigations and everything else, trying to identify weapons used in Syria or somewhere else, and then, like, they just wait for you, basically, to confirm. And, like, you see five, six people trying to gather information together and they still struggle to, to figure out what, what, what's the weapon used and then you arrive and you, like, everyone is waiting just for your confirmation or your opinion. So like, why do you think that, that journalists don't have maybe like the same tools? Like, do they have the tools to, or is it a lack of training or is it because we think in a different way from what you do? Why can't they do what you do? Um, I, I think it's just because they don't have time to sit down 18 hours a day and just look at this material. I mean, journalists, they've got proper stuff to, you know, they've got journalism to do. Theoretically, yeah. Yeah, in theory. Um, and, you know, it's, you know, I've had the advantage that I can, for like two years now, I've been able to watch every day videos coming from Syria. You know, when I look at a video now, it's funny, I go back and look at the videos from Libya and I see so much more mm -hmm. because I've trained myself to spot certain things like the weapons. You know, I see a weapon now, instantly I know, you know, almost instantly I can tell what it is. Um, and it's just a matter of training yourself, you know, to recognize that stuff. And it's very difficult when you're, you've got deadlines to meet to sit down and spend all day doing that. But I think there at least needs to be um, an awareness that this is something that can be done. Because, as I said before, it seems to me the issue now isn't so much that people need to be taught how to do it, but they need to be taught that they, it's something that can be done. Um, and, you know, I'm constantly talking to journalists who are just like, it's like I've shown them a magic trick when I've shown them what I've just been showing you. Yet it's not really that complicated. The Croatian weapon story, that was simply watching videos, writing down five key pieces of information, pulling it into a spreadsheet, and then looking at that and saying, okay, it seems like these groups are getting it, it's going to that area, and they all seem to be coming from Croatia. It was basic information, really, um, yet no one else had put it together before I did. Have you had media organizations ask you to come and do training for them? Um, yeah, well, I'm doing a, um, in July, I think July 24th, I'm Guardian. doing, yeah, Guardian I'm doing Master a Guardian Master Masterclass, so make sure you sign up for that. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm, I've, I've been invited to various organizations, and you know, journalism um, students, I've just done Cardiff University, I'm doing Birkbeck in London when I get back from here, just talking about my work. I think we have to leave. One last question, I think uh, everybody asked you this, but uh, I can't keep from it. Um, one day, when... Mm, and it's probably going to be a long time from now. Would you like to go to Syria? Um, I, yeah, but I get the feeling I'll have paid off my mortgage before it's going to be safe enough to go to Syria, unfortunately. Yeah. Great. Well, thanks Thank very much, so Elliot. Much, Elliot. Um, Thank you so much, Elliot. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Take care. Buona fortuna. Really appreciate it. Thanks for coming. Thank you.